hates me and I ain't got no home. My baby left me, I got no one to phone. Oh, Santa, I've been a bad girl, you know. But give me some loving under the mistletoe. The Sterilizer may be a less accurate title to anoint David Yates with than The Decontaminator, considering the outmatched length of his still ongoing reign at the directorial helm of the Wizarding World cinematic universe, but that the Harry Potter franchise maintained its lucrative fertility past the adaptation for Order of the Phoenix, in spite of the stylistic sterilization therein, is perhaps its most remarkable accomplishment. To put this adaptation one way, if Goblet was like eating a randomly selected assortment of a fast food restaurant's greasiest menu items, Phoenix is like reserving a 10-minute window to eat an unseasoned three-course meal at your neighbourhood's most popular cafe. Whether this was an intentional response to the mess Goblet turned out to be, I suspect not, since David Heyman claims Mike Newell refused their offer for him to continue on as director. We offered Mike the fifth film, but and we offered Alfonso the fourth, but I think they were just too exhausted. A questionable decision to have made had it gone through, but Phoenix, and by extension David Yates, although better than Goblet and what Muir may have gone on to yield, was still only the lesser of two evils. David Yates has been a great choice for the final four films. You know, he made the world more political, made it feel more contemporary. I was still befuddled why they asked me in the first place, frankly. When I got the phone call, I was gobsmacked, because I thought, you know, I just finished I think all sex traffic about a really intense, gritty, emotional drama, and they said, come to Hogwarts. And I, I just had to kind of think, hmm, that's an odd fit. And then they just haven't been able to get rid of me since. What Yates brought to this franchise, intentionally or not, was a pedestrian competency, malleable by the tools produced for his disposal, which is why Phoenix, Half-Blood and The Two Hallows, although all directed by him, are so visually different, and why the Fantastic Beasts films, also all directed by him and from the beginning held hostage by Rowling and her awful screenplays, are so lifelessly corporate. With meandering plots proportional to the physical depth of each book's pages, and Phoenix daring to adapt the deepest of those depths into the short film of the franchise, their attempt to squeeze an inoffensive fidelity into the tight blockbuster playground they restricted themselves with was, as uncontaminated as it may be, unable to achieve more than a superficial ticking of the book's most cinematically attractive boxes. A playground littered with uniquely precarious obstacles because the book series, the seventh and final entry of which came out shortly after this fifth film, featured still unknown narrative territory Rowling had, in spite of it nearing completion and her claims of having it all planned from the start, continued not to disclose all but one detail of, that being the supposed importance Creature would go on to have in that final book, the leaked warning of which caused instant speculation as to what said importance would entail, and the entailing of which, it turns out, wasn't so important to find its way into the over four hour adaptation of that final book after all. It may have only grown more true to the suits find themselves enticed by riskless and repeatable products, to the point of targeting newly accessible and exploitable demographics with repackaged derivatives of convincing enough quality they'll probably make their money back, and if not, they'll keep the brand wheel spinning, but I don't see Yates as a corporate puppet of the clearly appreciated symbiotic relationship he developed with, if not the cast and crew, then the studio Warner Bros itself. Or at least he started out as less of a puppet than the quality Fantastic Beasts presently suggests him to be. So it just feels very different to Potter, very different in a really special way. Um, An auto director like Ron might be able to find some artistic leeway, but the problem with these vastly expensive films that originate primarily as products is that everyone with a stake in the production wants a say in how to bake the cookies that will fill the hopefully large cookie jar they've spent years blowing up or, to be more succinct, too many cooks spoil the broth, though I don't think that saying highlights the greed and dishonesty too often found in such high-budget environments. As William Goldman, esteemed screenwriter of The Princess Bride, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and all the president's men said, Nobody knows anything. Yes, it's very important to know that we all know that. You, that's going to be on your gravestone. It is, it's it, right absolutely. there on the tombstone. Absolutely. And when did you say it, and what did you mean? I wrote a book years ago called Adventures in the Screen Trade. And one of the things about Hollywood is they don't know what they're doing. I think because costs are so high that they basically are terrified to make a lot of the stuff. In the 60s, you could make movies that weren't expected to make fortunes. So the variety of what was open to the studios was much, much wider now. Because now, if you want a star, it's $20 million. And a star you don't want is 10. So you're stuck with these huge costs. So they'll think, well, 
how can we amortize our costs? We'll make a movie that, you know, it will be less challenging, shall we say. There's a guy who's a new film critic for Esquire magazine who I don't know, but one of the things that brought my attention to what he writes is he said Steven Spielberg, as good as he is, has been bad for the movie business. He wrote a piece, I, I read it. It's, do you, do said, you agree with the piece? Well, it's interesting. You know, he said that Lucas and Spielberg were destroyed Hollywood. The point being, the real reality is it's not Lucas and Spielberg who are very brilliant and gifted. Right. It's the fact that their movies were successful. And the fact that when there's a success out there, since nobody knows anything, what they try and do is copy the success. Well, but you just said that after, after Jaws, which happened to be made by Steven Spielberg, right. nothing was the same. Nothing was the same because Jaws made more money more quickly than all those greedy studio heads out there dreamed possible. So suddenly they thought, guess what? Something will be bigger. Guess what Star Wars was? That wasn't going to be... E.T. was bigger. There's going to be something bigger than E.T. You know, Independence Day 2, when they figure out what it's going to be, is going to be gigantic. The whole deal has become so financially grotesque that they are cursed into making, for the most part, the studios, movies that they hope will do $100 million. Most movies don't. So it's all a giant roulette wheel and nobody knows nothing. They want clarity on their investments in an industry whose best stories are told with ambiguity, but franchise blockbusters, especially those adapted from already established sources, offer a cleaner path to that clarity, and so that's where most of the money goes. And because that's where most of the money goes, that's where it's hardest to find the risk-taking innovation and unfiltered artistic integrity. That Warner Bros would be itching to flip the emergency reboot Harry Potter switch from the day its box office gross ended was inevitable. The question, I guess they finally could couldn't bear to answer was when best to capitalize on both the original generation, promising a nostalgic and far more faithful multi-season adaptation, and the new generation who may just now be discovering the phenomenon this once was, double dipping the biggest money pot and highest viewing potential HBO or really any film and TV media brand has ever had. Anyway, before reaching the hellscape that is the preemptive criticism addressing cynicism so many blockbusters force into their emotionally detached cardboard boxes of today, Harry Potter, even all four of those directed by David Yates, have an undeniable sincerity towards their stories and characters, regardless of how much coin biting was going on behind closed doors. I imagine, under the pressure to pump out the next instalment within a lucrative window, filmmakers often adopt a let's create at least something, even if it's mediocre, attitude to working on these franchise sequels, the freedom they are given in budget diminishing the freedom they might have had in time. But with these last Harry Potter films, where the technical components are always at least good, if not exemplary, the issue is so much more fundamental. The desire to fulfill the expectations of as many fans as possible, whilst not actually knowing what's essential for the future and what's not, not knowing how much weight running intends to give plot threads and world buildings big and small, is a recipe for mediocrity. Since massively changing such a high profile story wasn't an option, the safest bet was to do what the previous four adaptations had done to varied results, leave in a bit of everything. And for as competent as this attempt at that may be compared to Goblet, it's fundamental mistake was in making a two hour long film instead of an at least three hour long film. And what do you know, there may very well have been a functioning three hour version Yates was forced by the studio to cut down. Even if they just used that time to more boldly tick all the boxes they would still turn out to have ticked in the two hour version we ended up getting, including those they shouldn't have ticked at all, it would have given everything a much needed time to stew. Their choice and use of ingredients to pull from the book's already unfocused narrative for that stew is, of course, what we'll gradually explore over this chapter. To go along with Yates's inoffensively political, get the job done style, and to the Clovis taking a break for this one arguably most difficult to adapt book, a new screenwriter by the name of Michael Goldenberg was hired to take on the challenge. So I just focused on the on the emotional through through line. What do we what do we care about the most? And then of course it's serious as dad. <sighs> Though not entirely free from the underdeveloped box ticking that made Goblet so messy, which as I said, I expect to have been the result of cutting down what was originally a three hour film, Phoenix is kept stable by the existence of a through line, streamlined from the book's same themes, around which every narrative beat revolves. If this sounds familiar, it's because it was the exact thing that kept the Prisoner film so satisfyingly self contained, though in that case, there weren't quite so many boxes to choose whether or not to tick, and Quran possessed keener cinematic eyes and ears by which to enhance Clovis's 
better script than Yates did for Goldenbergs. Instead of dwelling on the three-hour cut they for some reason never released as an extended edition as they had done for Philosophers and Chamber, the thematic streamlining in Phoenix involved thoroughly condensing the love in family and friendship Harry would go on to expel Voldemort from his body with. Utilising Harry's relationships with Sirius, Ron and Hermione, Neville's relationship with his parents, and even Hagrid's relationship with his half-brother, Grawp. That is not polite! We do something! We talked about this. You do not grab, do you? Who I argue shouldn't have even wasted the space he does in the book. Concerning this process, Gordenberg said that the tools of a screenwriter are opposite to those of a novelist. In a novel, you have the luxury of digressing and exploring and stopping to luxuriate in all the details. Screenwriting is first and foremost about compression, distilling, picking the one detail, the one telling image, or the dialogue that encapsulates what might have taken many pages in the book. We're looking at it from the other end of the telescope. Goblet was able to get away with skipping Privet Drive, but it's important for Phoenix not to do so, as eager to speedrun through the sweltering summer Harry sits idly by, as the film may be, his isolation from the Wizarding World organising the anger he underlies the whole year with. The film might not make it seem so, requiring more time to stew its emotions and a stylistic flair to more deeply portray them, but along with Phoenix being the most extensive dive into Harry's character, this Privet Drive opening is the most interesting of those in all the books. An unfamiliar Harry to go along with an unfamiliar daytime setting, in which he seeks a fight with Dudley and his gang, and, pushed over the edge by a Hogwarts expulsion he was forced into earning by some rogue Dementors, almost gets kicked out of, and runs away from the protection this neighbourhood, now more crucially than ever, provides him. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the Dementors causing this tension does come across as artificial, and the mystery of who sent them, the answer to which is obvious from the moment the character shows up at Hogwarts, is suitably forgotten and of little consequence by the time they admit to it. What motivation the Dementors would have to obey orders to attack Harry, who knows, and that he had to use a Patronus to defend himself because the order sent their most irresponsible member, Mundungus Fletcher, to watch over him, reveals the futility in Harry having to spend most of every summer at Privet Drive. Giving the job to Mundungus was stupid by itself but that he needed a guardian at all suggests Privet Drive isn't as safe as we've been led to believe. Whatever protects it limited to an invisible circle around number four, and Harry only having to stay there as long as he does each summer to, as Dumbledore sends a warnful letter to remind her of, use Petunia's blood to recharge the sacrificial protection Lily gave him as a baby, a protection that should no longer apply to Voldemort's and only Voldemort's attacks ever since he used Harry's blood to remake his body, and unless the Dementor attack coincided with his protection battery reaching full charge, the all Order were just letting Harry rot away at Privet Drive longer than necessary, only thinking, when the Dementor attack happened, that they should really get around to organising his escort to the considerably safer Grimald place. Safer, perhaps, than Hogwarts, and only compromised during Hallows when the trio accidentally teleported Death Eater through the Fidelius charm along with them. This torturous delay in socialisation, tempered only by the uninsightful letters Ron and Hermione sent him from where he deduces to be the same place they are spending the summer without him, really can't have come at a worse time than in the aftermath of Cedric's death and Voldemort return, discarded to the abusive home he grew up trapped in, without explanation as to why, by the people he had barely begun to learn to reciprocate vulnerability with. Or rather, though he might at this time envy and take his anger out on Ron and Hermione, they and everyone else are only putting their trust in Dumbledore's authority, whose concern letters sent to Harry might get intercepted shouldn't have stopped Hermione giving him occasional updates with a telephone, and whose continued disregard of Harry he would, by the end of the school year, claim to regret. Rather than a single howler announcing his expulsion and some order members arriving without warning in the film. In the book, Harry decides to make a run for it after the Ministry threatens to come destroy his wand, before another letter from Arthur reassures him that Dumbledore is on the case and that he's not to leave the house, do any more magic, or surrender his wand. Another letter from the Ministry revokes their threat and declares his expulsion will hang on a hearing, and though Harry expects the fourth letter flying through to be from Dumbledore and to explain everything, it disappointingly turns out to be an inadequately short affirmation from Sirius to not leave the house. Only when Vernon tries tries to kick Harry out of the house, fearful of the target on his back, does Dumbledore send anything himself? But Harry doesn't recognise the voice coming out of the Haller to beat Dumbledore, and it merely reminds Petunia of why Harry must stay. Left in the dark no less than before, the escort doesn't arrive that same evening, but after he sends three identically demanding letters to Sirius, Ron and Hermione, three whole days later, during which Harry either paced his room with restless energy or lay motionless on his bed, dreading the Ministry hearing that will decide his fate. Slightly alleviated by the friendly face of 
Lupin, Moody leading the escort after what happened during Goblet doesn't seem like the most appropriate way to again make contact with Harry, especially since the real Moody isn't the most comforting of authorities at the best of times, as he demonstrates on the flight over to Grimald Place, which while still a stretch of freedom Harry feels alive experiencing isn't the fantastical tour of London the film makes it out to be. After Harry is given the secret to discover and enter Grimald Place, the cramped dilapidation in the middle of a muggle neighbourhood of which seems unusual for such a pure blood supremacist family, he is quickly shunted upstairs, away from the ongoing order meeting, and into the almost equally uninformed presence of Ron and Hermione, the atmosphere turning sour with the volume of Harry's voice, until Fred and George interrupt with their facetiousness. Don't bottle it up though, mate. Let it out. Harry didn't really raise his voice enough in the film for them to have heard from wherever they apparated from or comment on it when they did, which, more than being an issue of including something just because it happened in the book, is indicative of Radcliffe never fully exploring the extent of Harry's anger. Complete nutter. Just stay away from me! Oh, well, I guess you should read The Prophet then, like your stupid mother. It'll tell you everything you need to know. Don't you dare talk about my mother like I'll that. I'll have a go at anyone that calls me a liar. Cedric Diggory's death was a tragic accident. It was murder. Voldemort killed him. You must know that. Enough! Oh, thank goodness. Next we need to... Look at me! In non-acting related areas, the film still pulls its punches with some of the darker parts of Harry's turmoil, an example also taking place in Grimald Place in the book being when Moody shows him the photo of the original Order members, the smiling faces of so many wizards, his parents included, unaware of the deaths and fates worse than death awaiting them, disturbing Harry so much he leaves the party and goes upstairs to find Molly horror struck at a boggart shifting into the corpses it might be her family's time to turn into in the new war. The two scenes together driving home how hopelessly dangerous the situation they're in is far more than the film's version, in which Sirius shares and, although we never see it again, gives Harry the photo like it's any regular piece of history he plucked from the album. She was killed two weeks after this was taken. Voldemort wiped out her entire family. Up until this point in the film, we have on two occasions seen Harry have night terrors, and now, on the Hogwarts Express, he gets a stylistically questionable nightmare of Voldy standing on platform 9 and 3 quarters in a suit. It's both silly and strange to see the Dark Lord in something other than his ethereal black robes, and although it's out of place with the dreams Harry continues to be troubled by, I get its on-the-nose implication of Voldy invading the Wizarding World's childish warmth. When, after Harry uses one of them to save Arthur's life, these dreams turn out to actually be real-time visions into Voldy's mind, Dumbledore orders Snape to train him in the sort of mind-blocking art of occlumency, training that should have started from the moment Domino suspected this connection, which must be from at least the beginning of this book, because he's been ignoring Harry out of fear Voldy will look through Harry's eyes to spy on him, a fear not unfounded, as on more than one occasion Harry finds himself struck by a hateful appetite to hurt Dumbledore, and elsewise connects to Voldy so strongly they exhibit the same manic emotions. Harry, at one point, starts to think he might be the weapon the Order revealed they believe Voldy to be after, knowing, of course, that this weapon is actually the prophecy Arthur was nearly killed protecting, but collectively withholding that fact from Harry until Dumbledore spills some beans at the end. Harry has another dramatic moment of isolation, in which he nearly runs away during Christmas break at Grimald Place, having used the extendable ears when visiting Arthur at St Mungo's Hospital to overhear Moody speculate that Voldy may be possessing Harry. He secludes himself, and plans to return to Privet Drive to cut himself off from everyone in the Order. Dumbledore's sixth sense, having told him this would happen, one of the sentient Grimald Place paintings brings a message telling Harry to stay put. Hermione abandons her skiing holiday to also spend Christmas at Grimmauld Place, and, with Ron and more importantly Ginny, stages an intervention for the sake of Harry's sanity. Harry is reassured to learn he isn't being possessed, but really he's just not being possessed in the controlling way Ginny was. The long distance connection Harry's scar and existence as a Horcrux gives him and Voldy remains vaguely unique throughout the series, and Harry's ability to block the connection fluctuates as the narrative sees fit. Their Horcrux hunting during Hallows at times either aided or hindered by windows into each other's thoughts. The connection doesn't exactly seem to be a case of legolamency and occlumency, but the skills used there are similar enough to apply, if, again, only vaguely. Legolamency is the ability to interpret a person's thoughts and feelings, and occlumency is the ability to mask or block those interpretations, and the most arduous obstacle of Harry's training to learn the latter is to do so under Snape, the worst possible professor Dumbledore could have chosen to force his way into Harry's head over and over. Like most magic, I imagine each of these powers are determined by an unexplained combination of practice and aptitude, but Snape's ability to thwart even Voldy's legolamency might not even have anything to do with possessing a more powerful occlumency, suppressing his deepest feelings with half-truths, ruthless compartmentalization, or just straight up manipulating every experience he goes through to only be ones that can't be used to doubt him. I've deceived one of the greatest wizards of all time. 
in a way tricking Voddy to falsely interpret what he sees without defying him with the mental barriers it would be suspicious to use. Still, besides telling him to rid himself of emotion and become a blank slate of nothingness before bed, Snape's training consists only of exposing Harry to brute force legolomancy attacks, so he either only knows how to use the ability instinctually, doesn't care to teach Harry any methods and is simply using it as an excuse to torture him because he hates him, or there's as little consistent scientific basis for it as every other piece of magic in the series. There's no discernible progress Harry makes over the short course of their training, but he doesn't completely fail to block Snape's attacks either. He just doesn't do it fast enough as would satisfy Snape, who in unearthing the deepest and most personal of Harry's recent memories and offering no constructive criticism, catches onto the fact Harry has been dreaming about a real location, the corridor leading to the Department of Mysteries. Snape is actually the one to put a stop to their training after catching Harry taking a peek at the memories he, before each session, hid in his pensive, literally removing the traces of specific memories from his brain so they can't be found. To save the time it would take to show Snape perform this almost ritualistic act and establish the reason he leaves Harry in the office unattended, the film instead has Harry accidentally force his way into Snape's mind. Successfully doing so on purpose would be impressively unbelievable, but Harry doesn't even use the Legolomency spell. He uses Protego. Protego! <laughs> the shield charm that physically protects the caster, which rebounds Snape's own legolomancy attack against him. Whilst this isn't a misuse of the spell, it happens fast and unexplained enough to seem like one. Enough. Luna Lovegood is a bizarre character, but who Harry really feels a closeness to, because he feels that they're, they're very similar people. Of the two Ravenclaw students, for this entry given more screen time, it is newcomer Luna Lovegood, not romantic interest Cho Chang, who better helps Harry cope with what he's going through. Already a fan favourite from the book for her unabashed weirdness and knack for embarrassing bluntness, Ivana Lynch came along with pitch-perfect casting, rivalled only by Robbie Coltrane's Hagrid, and an appetite to fight for the correct portrayal of not only her own character, but those of the others. Always wanted to be Luna. She's been a fan for ages, so I always wanted to be in the films. It's her first acting part, uh, and she's just fantastic. I thought, I'm going to do my impression of Luna, or my vision, what I think of her. I saw the tape, and basically the gist of it was, listen, if you don't cast me, that's okay, but, you know, you have made a big mistake, because I am Luna. This will tell. What's fascinating about Ivana, she's such a fan of Harry Potter. And when we're on the floor and we're working, she becomes Luna, because she's obsessed about her. You just don't like me. Well, that's not my fault. It's just because you have a different image of me, you know? Mm -hmm. so, um... And that was the difference between her and all the other girls who we interviewed for the part. The others could play Luna. Ivana Lynch is Luna. Hello, everyone. As one of the big seven young cast members Rowling holds in high regard, along with Daniel Radcliffe's Harry, Rupert Grint's Ron, Emma Watson's Hermione, Tom Felton's Draco, Matthew Lewis's Neville, and Bonnie Wright's Ginny, Ivana Lynch's Luna is a much more important character than her later rival to the series lets on, for instance being the only non-Gryffindor to take on a major role in Dumbledore's army. She shows up aboard the last Hogwarts carriage and Hermione awkwardly introduces her in the film. Everyone, this is Luna Love. Whereas in the book, it's Ginny who introduces her when they enter a train compartment she sat in. And Luna has a fiery, confrontational protectiveness of her own, most notably coming out whenever someone mocks the quibbler she religiously reads and which her father edits. This can be considered one example of the film's whitewashing Luna isn't the first to fall victim to, featuring all of her endearing witness, unconventional social etiquette, and willingness to embrace outlandish and extraordinary ideas, but none of her oblivious, overstaying outbursts of laughter or disproportionate anger in defence of her loyalties, nor her stubborn disregard for the probable and rational answers she conflicts with an exasperated Hermione over. The only exception, actor-wise, to my sort of didn't intrude rule was Ivana Lynch, yeah. who plays Luna, and I hear her voice when I write Luna. Hello, Harry. Luna, how do you know where I was? Raxperts. Your head's full of them. And I even put um, painted pictures on the ceiling of the, the uh, literary Luna's room in tribute to Ivana because she, the actress herself, is so creative, she's so talented, and I know her well. Yeah, that influenced the real, so she influenced the real Luna. Unfortunately, all my shoes have mysteriously disappeared. She's lost one of her parents. Harry's drawn to her because he feels they're sort of kindred spirits in a way. They're both outsiders, and so they kind of bond over that. If not always in the way we expect, 
In neither impromptu therapy session does Luna seem oblivious to the wisdom she's bestowing upon Harry. She's just accepting his presence with casual offerings of words that she's the right person in the right place and at the right time to give to him. The former scene, taking place in what must be an undangerously deep area of the Forbidden Forest, or else some other woodland within walking distance of the castle, is also accompanied by this year's new magical creature, Thestrals. Used as a visual representation of death and acceptance, the existence of this creature is unsurprisingly shallow and never followed up on outside of its thematic relevance to this entry. Despite an easy opportunity to continue that relevance where it left off, presenting itself through the Hallows in Deathly Hallows, which are vaguely theorised to have derived their mythologically deathly magic from the Thestral hair they may be partly made from. There's also no mention of their existence prior to Phoenix, but everybody already knows Rowling didn't plan as extensively as she suggests, or at least didn't deny the abrupt inclusion of things she didn't plan. You just write it, or is it planned in your head? You structure it all well. Um, sometimes a sort of a day of pure indulgence, I sit down and just let myself write, but normally that means you're going to hit about one and a half good ideas and the rest will be rubbish. It's normally very, very, very finely planned, what I'm going to do that day even. I make meticulous plans in advance. Did you know when you were writing book two that Harry Potter would continue? Yeah, I'd always, from almost from the start, I'd envisaged it as a seven book series, which would see him through wizard school and then he'd be a fully qualified wizard at the end of it. That, that's the sort of big story, how you qualify as a wizard, you see. And there is another bigger plot that's going on that I can't really talk about because it will ruin it for people who will read all the books. But um, so yeah, all of them were plotted in quite a lot of detail already, which obviously made it easier in a way. It wasn't as though I had to go back and sit down and think, right, what's the next book about? I already knew. So, that so the seven book cycle as a story is, is written in your head? Oh yeah, and bits of, bits of all of the books bar five. Five is still the sketchiest of the lot, so if people are waiting longer for five than any of the others, that's why. Hermione might not have read about Thestrals pulling the Hogwarts carriages, because no such tradition has existed until Hagrid's recent breeding and nurturing of what he proudly speculates to be the only domesticated herd in Britain. But if these Thestrals have been pulling the carriages for at least as long as the trio have been attending Hogwarts, then enough people must have seen them for their existence to become rumour. Luna can see them, and there's no way she and Harry are the only students to have up till now witnessed the death required to do so, let alone the professors for whom age has made them much more likely to witness death, and that those who can't see them can physically interact with them just as much as those who can, as proven by Hagrid's lesson in the book and their ride to the ministry atop their backs in both the book and film. A laughably absurd choice of transport they take in what they believe to be a time-sensitive situation, flying to the ministry, which resides at the other side of the country, with the hopes of saving Sirius, who Harry's vision told him to currently be undergoing torturous interrogation by Voldy himself. They choose to ride these flying horses, which even at airplane speed would take over an hour to reach London, instead of going back up to the flu power enabled fireplace Harry originally broke into Umbridge's office intending to use. We'll have to use the flu network. But Umbridge has all the chimneys of the surveillance. Not all of them. Or, to be more specific, in the book he uses the fireplace to contact Grimmauld Place, as he had done previously, and it's implied the fireplace, though set up for unmonitored contact, isn't set up for the transport or the Hogwarts fireplaces are typically barred from using. However, in the film, Harry is under what you're free to pretend to be the ill-informed impression that Umbridge's fireplace is set up for transport, which he enters the office with the specific intention of using, and unlike how Umbridge pulls his head out from the Grimmauld Place connection after he spoke to Creature in the book, she interrupts him before he can get so much as a finger in her fireplace in the film. So to clarify, in the book they have reason to believe, with all the broomsticks locked up, that the Thestrals they serendipitously happen upon are their only confirmed option, whereas in the film they make the probably incorrect decision to run not back up to Umbridge's office, but over to the Forbidden Forest they may or may not find the Thestrals roaming about. Of all the things Umbridge does this year, catching Harry breaking into her office with a sensor she set up after his previous successful attempt to use the fireplace is among the least repressive. After Dumbledore and Fudge had their falling out at the end of Goblet, and with Fudge thinking Dumbledore will form an army to overthrow his ministry government, Umbridge is sent to infiltrate the sheltered school of Hogwarts with an authoritarianism she's far too comfortable enforcing, a manifestation of the ministry's political corruption and a facilitation of Voldy's infiltration of it, which goes down in pretty much 
the same way it did during the First War. Fudge is conveniently idiotic to not only interfere in Hogwarts to suppress his misplaced fears of Dumbledore, but send one of the most deathy to concordant and falsely judicious politicians to do so, and one who hungers for power with more condescending provocation than perhaps any other. What exactly her motivations are, such as whether she's entirely self-serving, and the backstory that has moulded her into this fluffy pink sadist is never completely defined. All we're given to hate her is who she is and what she does, and whilst that might not make for the most interesting or nuanced of villains, it is presented with enough concentrated antagonism to become the most compelling villain of the series. The secret ingredient that helps Umbridge achieve this feat of being so hated is her comparative realism. Unlike the main villain of Voldemort, who is an immortal, magical Hitler, or the episodic and supporting villains of Quirrell, Lucius, Sirius, Pettigrew, Barty, Bellatrix, etc., Umbridge's status as an identifiable villain has nothing to do with what magical threat she poses. There may very well exist flavours of immoral parents and politically influential lords like Lucius, mysterious serial killers like Sirius is believed to be, backstabbing rats like Pettigrew, harmfully deceptive geniuses like Barty, racist lunatics like Bellatrix, and everything in between, but it is who Umbridge is that most of us reading these books or watching these films will have most likely had the displeasure of meeting once or more in our lives. Not to such an extreme extent, hopefully, but the Umbridges of the world unfortunately aren't hard to find, especially in places and positions of power. It is the view of the Ministry that a theoretical knowledge will be sufficient to get you through your examinations, which, after all, is what school is all about. Dolores Umbridge is a new character in this uh, film. Um, she's sent to teach there, but of course will not allow them to have their wands or anything like that. She just wants them to be little children who don't touch anything or do anything. She doesn't want them to be doing any spells that she thinks are dangerous. Also, she, you know, she's a woman who doesn't, isn't involved with children. To her mind, they're five years old. It's a very patronising thing, but not in her mind, and just has to teach them to do things in a safe atmosphere. I mean, it's health and safety gone bloody mad. She believes that that's the way forward, that everything's squeaky, squeaky clean. No mess, no argument, no thinking. I wanted her to be soft, to have a warmth to her look, because she's quite hard. You know, deep down, you deserve to be punished. Along with a twisted vanity, hypocrisy and prejudice, Umbridge's ruthless authoritarianism casts a shadow over her teaching of defence against the Dark Arts. The best job vacancy for the Ministry to control in their castration of the private army Dumbledore is allegedly organising. This is where Umbridge first plants the roots of her corruption that would spread oppressively enough across Hogwarts to cement her as by far the best villain to inhabit its walls. Not a name on the wind, or a faraway Dark Lord, but a tangible presence to fight back against, as the trio feel compelled to do with their formation of an underground Defence Against the Dark Arts Club. With an educational style reminiscent of teachers students know would rather do anything but teach, Umbridge deletes the practical exercise of skills and spells from the curriculum and forces her classes to silently read from the Ministry-endorsed textbook. At that point she's just condescending, but her self-righteousness comes almost immediately into view when Harry, speaking out against her teaching, proclaims Voldy has returned, and it's in the continued detentions Harry's defiance earn him in which she sadistically tortures Harry that she goes from being annoying to abhorrent. Already thoroughly disheartened by Dumbledore ignoring him, Harry stubbornly feels his detentions are a battle of wills, in which he shows no weakness to the pain that Umbridge is inflicting on him, nor a need to confide in his friends, or in professors he and everyone else come to realise, are quickly losing any authority they might have had over Umbridge. McGonagall, for instance, asking Dumbledore to override Umbridge's attempt to disband the Gryffindor Quidditch team, and showing her disapproval of Umbridge wherever and as unprovokingly as possible but otherwise advising Harry to keep his head low and his mouth shut, and punishing him with subtracted house points when he doesn't, inadvertently confusing Harry as to what he's expected to endure before seeking help. Factoring Harry's pride and arrogance into his treatment under the Dursleys having continually had a blind eye turned on it, this outcome in which he still refuses to run crying to Dumbledore is unsurprising, and taking their defence against the Dark Arts lessons into their own hands as they do eventually proves to be the fatal nudge into power Umbridge needs to altogether dispel that safety net. They call this training club that becomes illegal before it can have its first meeting, Dumbledore's army, not because of any particular loyalty to Dumbledore, but in amusing defiance of Fudge and the Ministry, and it is 
is this that hinders Dumbledore's ability to run innocence-proving circles around Umbridge when she assembles an insufficiently capable team to both remove him as headmaster and arrest him. The DA meetings are succinctly bundled together with Daily Prophet exposition articles and Umbridge's ever-growing oppression, including the Looney Tunes failings of her inquisitorial squad, into montages that are both essential to fit this bulk of the book's narrative into two hours and restrict its true impact. Having said that, the clarity with which they untangle Dumbledore's army from the book's half a dozen other subplots is where the film shines most. The montages might not give justice to Dumbledore's army or to the converse oppression Harry and everyone else is increasingly squashed by, but they do get the slightly diluted point across without muddying the waters with prolonged tangents into Fred and George's inventions, Ron's Quidditch practice, Harry and Cho's failed romance, Rita Skeeter's Quibbler article, Arthur at St. Mungo's, Harry's occlumency, Hagrid's giant diplomacy, and the lead up to and taking of the exams, all but the Quibbler article of which still find their way into the film in one way or another, except for Ron's Quidditch practice, which is instead condensed into half-blood print. The extendable ears they're first seen using at Grimmauld Place aren't the only novel and somehow hitherto unemployed magical item Fred and George are seen inventing, moving to monopolise the skiving industry with only Umbridge and the newly appointed Gryffindor prefects of Ron and Hermione to hold them back. A privilege anyone who has attended a school with prefects knows isn't deserving of Harry's disappointment at not becoming one, though beyond making him feel left out, this decision of Dumbledore's yet further isolates Harry from his two best friends. Having earlier interrupted Harry's interrogation, in which Harry avoids revealing anything about Sirius or Dumbledore by pretending to drink the tea Umbridge was attempting to drug him with, and Umbridge for some reason reveals her fireplace is open and unmonitored, the twins plan another commotion as a distraction for Harry to sneak in and use said fireplace. And after publicly declaring the end of their educations to Umbridge and Filch's faces, they inspire Peeves and much of the school's other troublemakers to carry on with various pranks in their absence. After Umbridge brands Harry and the twins with lifelong Quidditch bands for engaging Draco with what McGonagall refers to as muggle duelling, Ginny substitutes as Seeker and Ron gets through tryouts to become Keeper. The derogatory Weasley is our king song the Slytherins mock Ron with affect his nerves so badly even Fred and George stop poking their usual fun at him, and curiously it's after they leave Hogwarts that Ron has a temporary breakthrough and helps Gryffindor win the Quidditch Cup. Harry takes her eyes away from this final match along with Hermione when Hagrid asks for their help and leads them deep into the forest. The context here, and why Hagrid was nowhere to be seen for the first half of the school year, is that he and Madame Maxime were on a diplomatic visit to the world's last remaining giant. Long story short, it didn't go as planned, and he took as long to come back as he did because he was smuggling his half-brother, Grob, who Harry and Hermione have the displeasure of meeting here in the forest. Expecting to get the sack, Hagrid takes his irresponsibility to delusional height by asking them to look after Grob when he's gone, the constant bruised and bloodied state of his face speaking for itself, and the forbidden forest Grob resides in, all the more hostile because the centaurs no longer deem Hagrid welcome, having fallen out with Hogwarts after Ferenz became what they see as a servant as Trelawney's divination substitute. Already forced, out of place, and unnecessary in the book, Grob loosely ties into the themes of family and friendship, but mostly exists as an excuse for Hermione to lead Umbridge into his lair, where she's dragged away by the enraged centaur as the build-up of her hatred of half-breeds promised would be her fate. In the film, however, it's more egregious, not only because of the precious time it wastes, but because of the Disneyfication of Grob. In the book, Hermione is terrified enough of Grob to cower behind Harry, and with good reason, as their recent history of magic lessons on the giant wars, Hagrid's tale of his failed diplomacy, and Grob repeatedly beating him up, point only to the giant being a violent barbarian. That's not to say giants like Grob can't be to some degree rehabilitated, but it's certainly not a job for two 15-year-olds. The lovable oath makeover the film thinly coats Grob with is more irritating than convincing, and him having no later appearance after the centaurs take the chief role of disposing of Umbridge makes him little more than a shallow CGI spectacle of an action figure advertisement. Thank you, Corp. Worse than the giants allying with the Death Eaters is the occurrence of an Azkaban breakout that frees some of their most infamous members. Students whose relatives were once victims of these now-escaped Death Eaters, empathising with what Harry has all along lived with with his parents. One such student who hasn't at any point voiced doubt in Harry is Neville, whose parents Bellatrix tortured into permanent residency at St. Mungo's Hospital. His mildly vengeful motivation to improve her defence against the Dark Arts, insinuated when we see him visiting his parents in the book, and more blatantly established 
established in a brief conversation with Harry in the film. Hermione takes advantage of this change in attitude towards Harry by cashing in her blackmail of Rita Skeeter, the article she writes causing Umbridge to ban the Quibbler from Hogwarts, and the Streisand effect thereby ensuring everyone has either read or heard Harry's story. As someone who was once close to Cedric, Cho is particularly mournfully appreciative of this, but her and Harry's romance never recovers from the bumpiness originating from Cedric's death. The film more poignantly pinpoints why Cho is so tearful, and why her and Harry might not have worked out under any circumstances in their current grief-riddled state. That being Cho's guiltful conflict over liking Harry while still hung up on Cedric, and Harry's swept under the rug PTSD. But, rather than fizzling out through differing loyalties in the book, the film barely explores anything to do with Cho past her and Harry's mistletoe kiss. And, with Cho taking on Marietta's role as the Dumbledore's army snitch, but then revealing her snitching was coerced with Veritas serum, Snape should actually have been providing false doses of, giving the two of them no kind of reconciliation of a conclusion. The book's version isn't exactly satisfying, but it does at least noticeably fizzle out into a non-relationship. Hermione getting in Harry's way by arranging to meet with him the same day he'd go on a Hogsmeade date with Cho, which she wasn't pleased to hear about, and inflicting Marietta's face with that nasty pimple jinx, which Harry and Cho strongly disagree with the justification of. The discontinuation of Dumbledore's army and the attempt to arrest Dumbledore, in which Marietta doesn't have a pimple-related change of heart about snitching, but has her memories altered by Kingsley, isn't the climax of Umbridge's reign of terror in the book as it is in the film. Or rather, arresting Dumbledore and becoming headmistress is the biggest milestone she fulfills and the highest point her power reaches, but it isn't the final nail she hammers in Sirius's coffin. That crime is one of her most despicable, and takes place during Harry's astronomy exam. The exam attendees and invigilators alike, looking out the windows as Umbridge and five auras make their way down to Hagrid's hut and instigate the violence with which he's forced out of Hogwarts. McGonagall, in her appalled intervention, knocked unconscious by four simultaneous stunning spells, sending her to St. Mungo's Hospital and, along with Hagrid, leaving Harry with no professors he feels he can turn to when invited to the Ministry by that dreaded final vision. Sirius. You were going to Dumbledore, weren't you? No. <laughs> You're sent for me, headmistress. Snape, yes. Umbridge already has Harry in her grasp when he realises one last Order member does in fact remain, Snape. As untrustworthy as the trio has always felt Snape to be, it sure still is idiotic that Harry, Ron and Hermione forgot about him until seeing him, especially given the confrontation he and Sirius had to grow a place in the book that I doubt Harry forgets having to physically wedge himself between, and which was only interrupted by Arthur's return from the hospital. Never mind that, Snape answers Umbridge's Veritaserum requesting call, and Harry cryptically warns him, a crypticism film only watchers may find themselves as equally confused by as Umbridge. Bridge. Padfoot? What is Padfoot? Where what is he? What is he talking about, Snape? Prisoner having missed its opportunity to with prudence establish the nickname Padfoot, and neither Goblet or Order mentioning it in any conversations about or letters sent to Sirius. Snape does decipher this warning, but gives so little impression that's the case that Harry thinks he didn't or doesn't care, and so while Snape goes through the motions to properly confirm Sirius's whereabouts, Harry takes things into his own hands anyway. Let's not forget that in the film, Hagrid and McGonagall, whilst perhaps not actively working Order members, are trustworthy allies still very much at Hogwarts and open for Harry to go to for help, and that Harry doesn't even attempt to confirm whether Sirius is or isn't to the Ministry, making no contact with a Grimmauld Place and therefore not getting tricked by Creature. Admittedly, making contact with Grimmauld Place might not have happened in the book either, if Hermione, in her continued role as a lampshade of narrative perception, didn't insist on it. She makes what should be the obvious point that Voldy, in his ostensible manipulativeness, and having a window into Harry's mind as he does, will know to take advantage of Harry's saviour complex. If only someone of more hospitable wisdom and guidance than Snape had confirmed that, whilst his vision of Arthur was real, Vordy has noticed the connection and it's within his power to implant false visions, he might not act with such impulsive delusion as thinking he and his 14 and 15 year old friends can save Sirius from a trap set by Vordy. When they arrive at the inexplicably deserted and defenceless ministry, cramming into a telephone booth to be elevated down in the book, and teleporting into an immediate run across the atrium in the film, they make their way towards the source of the vision, the Department of Mysteries, within which they explore the most interesting world buildings and engage in the best action set piece of the series. In the book, that is. What has all film long been a sterilised simplification of the book, sometimes to positively succinct results, reaches its worst and final form, victimising its climax with disappointing indolence. 
We have the biggest battle in history at the end of this movie. A wizarding battle has never really been committed to film on the scale that we'll be doing it. The book's significantly deeper and fantastical version of this set piece isn't without its flaws, the most prevalent of which is the plot armor resulting from inconsistent magical mechanics that undermine the whole series, but I'll take something that attempts to introduce interesting ideas, even if those ideas remain unelaborated in their mysterious peculiarities, over something that in its blandness bears no bountiful harvest, merely highlighting the worst and most mundane aspects of its source. Rather than finding themselves teleported to another disconnected and uninteractable set piece when they reach the Hall of Prophecies, in the book they must go on a journey to find it by guessing which door in an impossible to navigate wall of revolving doors it lies behind. In these rooms we encounter various ambiguous displays of magical experimentation, leaving us to fill in the gaps of what they might be experimenting or where they originated, and setting the scenes through which the Death Eaters would soon be meandering in their pursuit, some of which we and Harry in our separation from the others only hear and see the aftermaths of. It's chaotic and fraught with injuries the recipients are lucky don't bring them as close to death as maybe they should, and though the Death Eaters seem unusually unwilling to more harshly attack these teenagers, they have the weak excuse of not wanting to destroy the prophecy Voldy is foolish to again seek under such farcical restraints. Why not wanting to destroy the prophecy as a weak excuse is because it shouldn't, in their castings of Accio, be difficult to snatch out of whoever's hands hold it, and the chaos through which which they chase it brings it miraculously closer to destruction than anything else, until it eventually does end up destroyed. Vivaldi's motivations on which this whole plot rides, and the convoluted and contrived Ministry infiltration plan that goes along with it are so foolish and farcical, is because of the confusing and scarce benefits of acquiring the prophecy and the ease with which it was within his power to do so. Attempts were made to control Ministry employees to go in and take the prophecy, which would have been the easiest option if the prophecy orbs didn't have protections that only enable someone who is a subject of the prophecy to take them. A protection we have to assume to be unbreakable, even for Voldy or Dumbledore, because otherwise surely Dumbledore would have secretly hidden it long before Voldy thought to seek it, or, as we'll shortly get into, outright destroyed it. Learning of the nature of this protection, Voldy now had the following restriction stowed upon his desire, that either he or Harry Potter, of whom the prophecy he seeks is about, must enter the Hall of Prophecies and acquire it by their own hand. Voldy needn't have lured Harry to perform this act at all, rather he could have entered the hall and found the specific row of shelves he knows his orb to be sat upon and taken it out with as much undiscovered stealth as an assembly of his Death Eaters appear to have been able to. It's especially silly he didn't do this from the very start, when, after Harry reveals the prophecy smashed to pieces without anyone hearing it, he shows up in the atrium anyway, trying to kill Harry but ending up in a duel with the one person he'd rather not end up in a duel with, and confirming his return to a large and well-timed arrival of witnesses. But it gets even sillier when he realised the orb's protection needn't even have been alleviated to acquire the prophecy, as his Death Eaters demonstrate when spells they shoot at the protagonists hit and smash several nearby orbs, all of which begin spewing their prophecies over the top of each other. Entering the Hall of Prophecies undetected is the easy part, when all you need to do is smash the orb with Harry's name on it, listen to the prophecy, and relay it to Voldy. And the film makes this yet sillier in the prophecy replaying itself not when its orb is smashed, but when Harry picks it up, under which circumstances a Death Eater need only have waited invisible nearby to eavesdrop. For neither can live while the other survives. Maybe Voldy doesn't trust his Death Eaters to accurately or truthfully relay the prophecy, needing the unequivocal knowledge of picking up or smashing and listening to it himself. But why then does he trust them to physically obtain and transport the orb? Then there's the matter of what the end of the prophecy states and what Voldy might have done knowing it. Dumbledore is the only person who knows the full prophecy, having been present when Trelawney went into her prophetic trance to make it. Snape eavesdropped and ran to Voldy to tell him the unfinished prophecy, and Voldy uses that info to target one of two possible children it could have referred to. What he now so desperately wants to know, and seeks the full prophecy to learn, thinking it will explain why Harry continues to thwart him, and which Dumbledore tells Harry his interpretation of after returning from the Ministry, is that the so-called Chosen One will be that which Voldy marks as his equal. It is this, and that Voldy never knew the prophecy ended with this, that has made it, as Dumbledore interprets, self fulfilling. It's also why, although the prophecy could have applied to Harry or Neville, it has only applied to Harry ever since Voddy chose him to pursue first. 
Regardless of whether the prophecy and Harry being the chosen one is true, no matter when Voldy learns of the full prophecy, whether in Snape's original message or from the orb at the end of Phoenix, his only logical and survivable course of action would be to stop pursuing Harry immediately. Therefore, the only excuse Dumbledore has to prevent Voldy learning the full prophecy and in turn stop trying to kill poor Harry is he believes only Harry can bring about Voldy's demise, an oddly superstitious interpretation he plants as the flimsy crutch on which this entire series leans. Dumbledore convinces Harry in their conversation at the end of Phoenix and midway through Half-Blood that the fate awaiting him is one where he or Voldy must kill the other. Still withholding the full truth about Harry's nature as a Horcrux and exaggerating the extent of Harry's importance. The only thing that needs to happen to be able to kill Voldy is the destruction of all of his Horcruxes. Who destroys the Horcruxes and who deals the finishing blow after they're destroyed is irrelevant. That Harry goes on a drawn out and fortuitously successful journey involving Lily protecting him with a sacrifice Voldy had no reason to allow her to perform, Voldy tethering him to life by using his blood, the finding of all the Horcruxes, and the ownership of all three Deathly Hallows and the acceptance of death that lets Harry's sacrifice protect and save more of his Hogwarts battling allies than might otherwise have survived, is just the path Dumbledore somehow, and in spite of his death, meticulously and coincidentally ensured would defeat Voldy without getting everyone else killed in the process. This isn't a secretly, alternatively compilable theory of Harry Potter's entire plot, but it is an abominably contrived puzzle that suffocates more and more under the weight of each instalment, and one which famously puts into question Dumbledore's morality and sanity. But to summarise the role the prophecy plays in Phoenix, it has all along been, as the secret weapon Voddy was rumoured to be after, too weak of a mystery and too weak of a MacGuffin for the year's plot threads to satisfyingly converge around in its climax. That after everything, the prophecy ends up smashed, and Harry only learns of its unsurprising promise that he will end the series by facing its main antagonist is inconsequential. Voddy seems to get along fine without it, would have gotten along even better if his idiocy didn't continue, and would ultimately have won the war if Harry didn't trip and tumble towards triumph as he has done all series. With the Death Eaters flying around in puffs of smoke, the protagonists can barely be considered under attack, or, if Lucius is to be believed as the leader of this group, even in danger, peacefully requesting Harry hand over the orb whilst all of his friends struggle with ones pointed at their backs. In the book, on the other hand, it is when Bellatrix is torturing Neville with Crucio that Lucius reaches to take the orb Harry has finally decided to give up, and the Order members don't swoop down in their never again seen golden good guy equivalent of smoke flying, but appear out of nowhere and Lucius doesn't clumsily fall with the orb and watch it smash before him, but it smashes when Harry is helping Neville and his wobbly legs up amongst the new round of chaos, which comes to a sort of standstill when Dumbledore makes an earlier and more aggressive appearance than strolling out of an atrium fireplace as he does in the film. But their last blow against the protagonists is dealt by Bellatrix, and amongst the variety of other injuries the Order collect in the book, it's the worst blow by far. The unceremonious quickness with which Sirius dies in the book is in part what makes his passing so hard to accept, pushed back by an unimportant spell and falling through the veil, as opposed to the killing curse Bellatrix hits him with, delaying what should be an instant death enough for him to make eye contact with Harry, and then, having already died, falling through the veil. We know the killing curse instantly kills those it hits, leaving the film with none of the disturbing ambiguity of what exactly the veil is and whether Sirius is really dead. Himself distraught over what just happened, Lupin lets Harry go and watches him run after Bellatrix. After sprinting past the injured and incapacitated bodies of all his friends, it's less that Harry hunts her and more that she lures him away with her manic taunts, awkwardly running up the elevator and across entire corridors until meeting in the atrium. When Harry reveals the prophecy is gone, Bellatrix is more scared of how mad Voddy will be than anything else, yet still she warns him not to come out of hiding. The orders are on their way. <laughs> After Dumbledore modestly stalemates their duel, Voddy tries to have the last laugh by properly possessing Harry. You've lost, old man. 
in the book, instead of speedrunning the sympathetic realization that Vody's weakness isn't just his inability to feel love, but his complete aversion from feeling it. To the point Harry can use his love as an irregular occlumency style protection, Dumbledore sends Harry back to his office, where he and his thoughts are left to be questioned by the headmaster portraits, until Dumbledore finishes wrapping things up with Cornelius Fudge. When Dumbledore finally does appear, he patiently listens as Harry unleashes all the years pent up fury, and with his usual and at present irritatingly calm composure, takes responsibility for everything he's put Harry through this year and in the 14 that came before it. Which, besides explaining the prophecy with his usual exposition masking riddles, includes coming to the conclusion Sirius's death is his fault. Harry is still at fault, and for one specific reason, but Dumbledore admits the combination of his actions are what put Harry in that position, telling Harry he'll tell him everything, as he should have done five years ago, and claiming he hasn't been able to until forced to now because he cares for Harry too much to burden him with the truth, and then not telling Harry the whole truth, sure makes it difficult to accept his apologies as genuine, but the point of this scene the film misses out on is that, as a teaser for the intimate humanity Dumbledore demonstrates during Half-Blood Prince, we confirm he isn't and has never been some kind of godly safety net or paragon of wisdom, and that Harry no longer blindly worships him as such. I care too much about you. Harry, I protest! Harry, you put your name in a cupboard of fire! No, sir. What Dumbledore isn't aware of to alleviate, and would have no basis to if he was, is the mirror Sirius was prompted to give him out of anxiety about how Snape might treat him in their occlumency lessons. A mirror Harry doesn't use, and doesn't even unwrap to find out what communication device Sirius could have possibly given him, out of fear that asking for help would cause Sirius to put himself in danger. When Harry discovers the mirror in his trunk, it just twists everything into a brief disarray all over again, knowing that with a direct lifeline to Sirius, he needn't have been tricked by Creature. Harry never checking what Sirius gave him can barely be considered a plot hole on its own, because he had reasons to expect Sirius to act rashly, but that hole deepens with Harry overlooking it entirely when the time to contact Sirius does actually come, for something not very urgent concerning his father's past bullying of Snape, and deepens further with Sirius not telling Harry, within the fireplace they confer, to use the item he gave him. However, that's nothing in comparison to the film foregoing including the mirror at all, and then much later, during Deathly Hallows, showing Harry carrying around this random shard of glass until the blink at any missed moment, he asks it for help, and then help comes in the form of Dobby, and then in Deathly Hallows Part 2, the owner of the mirror's twin turns out to be Aberforth. Never mind that bizarre oversight, which we can only hope wouldn't have been overlooked had they known the mirror shows up again past Phoenix. Sirius's death is particularly painful, not only because of Harry's hand in causing it, but because of the vulnerable and formative time it strikes Harry, and the mutual restoration their relationship fulfilled, which is unlike Harry's father-seeking relationships with anyone else in the series, and, along with who exactly Sirius is, comes across quite differently between the book and film. Whilst the Sirius, locked up in Grimm place in the book is raring to go out and help the Order, and, as Hermione puts it, living vicariously through the trio's efforts to resist Umbridge, the Sirius in the film is considerably more even-tempered, responsible, and fatherly. I want you to take the others and get out of here. What? No, I'm staying with you. You've done beautifully. Harry's last spark of denial, after finding and shattering the mirror, is that Sirius might return as a ghost. Nearly headless Nick was expecting Harry to visit him, and I guess, in his own weary ghost way, lets him down gently that Sirius definitely won't return to haunt Hogwarts or anywhere else. Harry goes back into depression mode, and, whilst everyone else is attending the end of year feast, wanders Hogwarts alone, until realigning with the film when waddling across Luna and strangely finding that he doesn't mind talking to her about Sirius. Anyway, my mum always said, the things we lose have a way of coming back to us in the end. Other minor bookend events include some inconsequential nonsense with the house points hourglasses, Dumbledore strolling in and out of the forest to rescue a traumatised Umbridge from the centaurs, Harry hesitating to tell Ron and Hermione that he must either become murderer or murdery, Draco blaming Harry for his father getting imprisoned, and the Order members accompanying Harry to King's Cross Station to ensure the Dursleys don't dare mistreat him this summer, which Harry greatly appreciates as he waves goodbye and walks out with the Dursleys hurrying behind him. I've got one thing that Voldemort doesn't have, something worth fighting for. The film of course opts out of all of this for an easily digestible slice of fallacious positivity. Fallacious because Voddy obviously does have things he believes to be worth fighting for. Begin.
Half-Blood is no small diversion of its own, but this for now concludes what I see as the three winding narrative, thematic, and stylistic diversions that determine where and how the books and films find their respective ends. Correcting and uncorrecting the course each subsequent instalment was open to take, with the exception of the Goblet of Fire film, whose only area of correction was the essential exclusion of Spew. The disappointment to have missed out on what Kron's continuation with the films could have looked like is, I feel, a much agreed upon sentiment, especially since even with Prisoner having given him the least fantastical action set pieces of the series, he still, in hindsight, delivered the most visually striking and emotionally enthralling cinematic harmonies of the franchise, and for as great as Children of Men is, it doesn't quite stretch far enough to fully bandage the wounds Goblet clumsily aggravates and Order cautiously attempts to sterilise. I don't want to discourage screenwriters and directors from bringing their imaginative interpretations of a source to life, but when something is part of a franchise several instalments deep, it really needs to adhere to some kind of stylistic or thematic foundation or throughline. Like a new season in a serial drama TV series, you should aim not to reinvent the wheel, but to improve it, oil it, and possibly repurpose it. If you are going to tread down a significantly new path in one or more directions, at least make it a more traversable one, and one which can be identified and followed as a continually improvable adaptation of the source. Whilst Goblet gave its potential film adaptations several action-packed fantasy spectacles to go along with a, relative to the other instalments, impactful mystery that reaches an impactful climax, Order, in spite of its length, provides substance almost exclusively in Harry's character development. It's that which, more than its length, made Order a more difficult book to adapt a film than Prisoner and Goblet, and either second to or tied with Half-Blood as the most difficult to adapt in the series. Both of them refer to as having middle chapter or middle book syndrome, Order for its focus on Harry's character development and Half-Blood for its focus on Voldy's, as well as for each of their attempts to establish the themes of love with what Ronning seemed to deem and I will treat as obligatory romance subplots, an obligation that made Half-Blood the most controversial adaptation of the franchise. Oh,